ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my pleasure to to uh, introduce uh, uh, today's uh, uh, ISTT education webinar. Uh, and also, I would like to welcome you to join uh, today's webinar. As you can see from the screen, the uh, topic of today's webinar is uh, rehabilitation of a sewer manholes. And also, you can see from this slide, we have uh, two distinguished uh, speakers uh, for today's uh, webinar. Um, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ian uh, Nay Smith and uh, and um, uh, Mr. Marcus Giller, and I would like to uh, briefly introduce them. Uh, Dr. Nay Smith is a senior research fellow at the IKT uh, for more than thirty five years, experience in um, environmental water and the sewer related research. Uh, based in UK, he has a particular focus on the international project. And the, and the knowledge sharing for uh, nonprofit engineering research institute. Uh, he has been involved in the uh, evaluation of performance of sewage repair and re rehabilitation products, and the products in contact with the drinking water for more than 20 years. And uh, uh, for uh, Marcus, uh, he is a senior research fellow in the project manager at the IKT. And uh, he led IKT's two-year ev evaluation project on the rehabilitation of a sewer manhole, which is the topic of today's speech. And he is currently managing a two-year evaluation of uh, pressure uh, sewer rehabilitation techniques. And, uh, is, and he is now developing a IKT new heavy rain la laboratory that will examine the interaction between surface and underground drainage uh, infrastructure. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, our speaker. Um, I believe Ian, you will lead the speech, right? Yes. The ground is yours, the ground is yours, please. Thank you very much. And uh, as I was joking with Marcus earlier, he's here to answer any difficult questions at the end but he might have trouble with his sound when we ask him. Um, yes, welcome everybody. What I am guessing is that most of you in the audience today are not working directly for the owner of a sewer network, a, a municipality or a private sewer network owner, but you'll be more involved with the supply chain, either providing um, products, suppliers, or as contractors dealing with installations, um, consultancy, or in our case, research for the water and sewerage companies. So what I'm talking today is actually more from a perspective of the owner of a sewer manhole, because that is the reason that IKT uh, exists to do this research on their behalf, to look at problems and to find solutions for them. I'll do the presentation. Marcus will help out where needed. So the content of today's presentation, we've broken it in four parts. So I'm going to begin by setting the scene. Really, um, what are the functions of the sewer uh, manholes? And therefore, what are the types of issues that sewer network owners really want to deal with? I'm then going to explain how we compared and examined rehabilitation techniques. And then what we found, some of the initial findings. But really finishing up with perhaps what the core of this is about is um, quality assurance. If somebody is, is working for a water company or a sewage company to install a rehab system, or if they are the customer who is receiving it, they are, will be interested in how to apply quality assurance to ensure you get it right first time and there is no need to go back and do any further work on it. And the results, everything that I'm talking about today is publicly available. And at the end, there's a link to 600 odd pages of reports that were produced by our institute in Germany, uh, which support the uh, findings which we'll be mentioning today. So if we begin by considering what is a sewer manhole? Well, obviously what you see at the surface and what most people see is not really indicative of what lies beneath. 
it's usually a bit smaller and the body of the shaft probably widens out down, down below. And a sewer, at the minimum, a sewer network, so will usually have an inflow pipe and an outflow pipe. It will be surrounded by soil or various bedding materials. But what lies beneath the surface will vary in terms of the material it's made of and its dimensions. But what exactly are the functions? So the primary function of the manhole is actually relief of pressure. So if there is a blockage or if there is surcharging, too much uh, wastewater or, or surface water is entering for the capacity of the sewer, it will usually manifest itself in a, uh, a spill at the surface, forcing off the lid and potentially causing flooding. It's often the first indication that there is a failure of the sewer system itself. And um, we should also just bear in mind that almost another hydraulic function is a manhole may be at a location where there's a change in height. You may get a, a lateral sewer coming in. It may actually almost form part of the sewer system if uh, water is entering at different heights uh, into it. So that can affect what happens at the lower end of it. It's increasingly people are realizing they have another function in terms of retention. So that actually there's some almost active management of sewer networks, perhaps during heavy rainfall events, to use any spare capacity in manholes or the sewers to hold back some water, perhaps to enable better sewage treatment at the bottom end. So another obvious function is access. And in many cases, actually rehabilitation of sewer, sewer uh, manholes needs to take into account the rehabilitation of the man access. And increasingly with health and safety concerns, we're starting to see people taking it, taking this extremely seriously. And in one or two cases, water sewage companies actually saying, we're not going to rely on the rungs anymore. We're going to use ladders. We're going to use other means of access for safety purposes. But this does mean that as well, when you're looking at rehabilitation, if you're sending a man into the bottom, then the stability of the manhole that is surrounding him is of increasing concern. And of course, we have issues to do with um, gas, need for personal protection equipment, etc. Another primary function is the exchange of gases. Particularly in Germany, it's the manhole that is used to um, allow air to and enter into a sewer network and for uh, gas to escape. And this, of course, um, brings in a whole other issue that we have in terms of corrosion, hydrogen sulfide gas, etc. And as part of a rehabilitation, if you're dealing with corroding um, manholes is a consideration of what is actually happening in terms of the atmosphere within it. And uh, we did do one small one project, which was actually a comparative evaluation of odor control devices. It's not the topic for today, but we looked at different ways in which you could fit a device below the manhole cover in order to deal with um, smells that were escaping, but without interfering with the exchange of gas. And that was an important element of it. So we then have a couple of secondary functions that need to be considered with a manhole. And perhaps the primary, and this is particular focus of what we're talking about today, is water tightness. So over time, manholes may start to fail, particularly at times when you have high groundwater, uh, you will get groundwater ingress. And this picture here is particularly interesting. If you note, it shows water coming in at various points through the mortar surrounding these bricks. And the consequence of this in severe cases is you can get surcharging of the sewers, which can have a quite a severe impact of large quantities of groundwater getting in on let's say treatment processes downstream. Another secondary function is loading and safety. 
we're not scope focusing today on manhole uh, safety, but if you're a sewer network owner, this is an area of concern. And there are many new techniques coming in for improving the, the bedding or rehabilitating just the ring section at the top. So it might get a lot of forces here. But of course, lower down, it, there may be as a result of loadings which are starting to occur after the installation of the, of the manhole, or perhaps there's some new services that you put in next to it, uh, you may get pressure on the side of the manhole, which is going to affect its integrity. So that was just a brief reminder of why we have manholes and therefore the types of things which you could look at with manhole rehab. Uh, what we are particularly focused on today is, is dealing with the ingress of uh, groundwater. I mentioned before that the manholes come in many different types of material. And here is a listing of perhaps the types that you may come across, ranging from concrete and masonry, bricks and mortar, through organic materials, plastics, polymer mixed concrete, into other inorganics like stoneware or combinations of materials. And I wanted to highlight this because it explains why we focused on a particular type of manhole. And that is the uh, proportions in Germany. This is based on 2007 data. I may have changed slightly in terms of the, con of the numbers, but basically 72% are made of concrete. And the majority of those tend to be segments, stacked up segments of, of precast concrete manhole. Uh, another nearly 30% of masonry, bricks and mortar, which is two materials. And of course, as, you're, as we know, it's the mortar rather than the brick that can let uh, water through or fail. At the time, relatively little in terms of these other materials to be aware of. So if we move into what are the issues that were particularly concerning German sewer network owners with these. And in terms of the actual uh, un rehabilitated sewer uh, manhole, we're looking at infiltration and corrosion. As you can see on the right here, complete loss of the mortar or damage occurring, thinning the wall of the manhole. And then when it comes to leakage or infiltration, you can get it pouring, spurting, you can get damp patches, you can get moisture dripping down the inside, an indication that is no longer tight. But then um, what they were also noticing is when they were uh, installing rehab techniques, they were finding issues with those. So on the left-hand side here, we have uh, material breaking away or, or corroding, failing. It's been lined, but it's no longer necessarily functioning. Here's a, a looks like a plastic coating with leaks coming through, or you get uh, the other thing that was being discovered was bulges. So what you can see here, this looks like it's at the point where there is the joint between a couple of rings and a circular manhole, and the, this must be water pressure behind, perhaps during installation, causing it to bulge out. Now, if you're a uh, sewer network uh, operations staff person being expected to go down a manhole where you see the side starting to bulge in on you, you may think twice about going in. And so there is perhaps this is one of the issues that one needs to think about. So it's a combination of known issues with manholes and then issues starting to appear when you have rehabilitation uh, techniques were installed. So why are we actually presenting today? Well, it was around about 2001 when so network owners we were dealing with were reporting problems, increasing number of problems with manholes. And so we started to gather information on what was available and to what extent they were starting to use what were then relatively new technologies for rehabilitating the manholes. And that led to a number of field case studies going and looking at um, individual exercises during the mid 2000s. Um, by the late 2000s, we were doing an early research project on rehab. And uh, that odor control project I mentioned came in around 2010. So by that time, we were building up quite a body of knowledge with the sewer network owners about the issues and what they needed to do. 
And that finally led to a major study, this comparative exercise on the performance of manhole rehabilitation products. Uh, the main the work really started around about 2012. The main project was 2014 to 16. And all told, about 4 million euros worth of research was undertaken on manholes. And since then, this has led to quality assurance field studies on hundreds of manholes in Germany and the Netherlands and training courses to impart the knowledge to those who want to be expert in the rehabilitation of manholes. So if we consider then, um, how do we go about examining them and defining damage patterns and reviewing what's available on the market? So the project, uh, this 2014-16 one, its main aim was to determine, can you actually permanently make a manhole watertight, again, using uh, a rehabilitation method? And the funding came from two sources. It was a, the Ministry of the Environment in North Rhine-Westphalia. Germany is divided into Lander or, or states, and each has their own environment ministry. In North Rhine-Westphalia, they have a very particular focus on groundwater um, issue, uh, issues. And that ministry, together with 17 sewer network owners, for, um, funded it. And the 17 network owners formed the steering group to make the major decisions on what would be undertaken. So we focused on the rehab technologies and we focused on what quality issues you need to be aware of. But it also considered two other aspects of rehabilitation. And that was first of all, the effectiveness of high pressure jetting for surface preparation. Now with many of the systems, in fact, probably most of the different technologies, they tend to rely on adhere, adhesion to the existing wall of the host um, manhole. And in order to be able to get that right, you have to prepare the surface. And the primary way of doing that is with pressure jetting. And then what was also realized from the previous work was that in many cases, uh, plugging mortars are used to control infiltration before applying the rehab technique. So when you've got water already coming in, you've got to stop it off before you can apply a rehab technique. And so we, I'm going to, what I'm just going to touch on now is very briefly what we looked at with the high pressure jetting and with the plugging mortar before uh, focusing on the rehab technology evaluation. And just a reminder, I keep, I keep mentioning this, it's about providing detailed knowledge for everybody. So the manufacturers learn from it, the contractors learn from it, the consultants learn from it, and the customers learn from these exercises um, about what to consider and providing better knowledge. So if we think about, first of all, about the substrate preparation, uh, a market review is done of the standards and the available solutions. And we've got here three pictures. On the left-hand side, it's a, um, a lance for uh, using pressure jetting about to be applied to a slab of concrete. Here, we've got an automatic system for jetting being lowered into a uh, circular manhole. And on the right, just an example of a, a, a concrete slab with, as you can see, it's had different pressures applied perhaps at different angles looking at what was the most effective way of uh, cleaning or removing the surface layers. So the about 410 jetting tests were undertaken. And if you're interested in jetting, then um, in, uh, available with the published reports are the results of, the, of this exercise. So it was looking at many different things, different substrates, different angles of the jet, different pressures, nozzle types, etc. And initially we looked at the manual lances, then we looked at the automatic systems, but of course, for health and safety requirements, it's probably usually an automatic system that needs to be done, used down the manhole. And things like distance and angle of the jet were very significant with regards to efficiency. And 
what came out of this was that you do need to have a very, very clear understanding of what requirements are, there are for any manhole rehab technique that you are using. You must read the manual, discuss it with the supplier and work out what's actually required. And also we discovered that you need to be extremely experienced with the way in which you use the jetting. And even with an automatic jetting system that you put down the manhole and back out again, you probably need to go in and finish off by hand to make sure you've absolutely prepared the surface because that is essential if you're going to get the bonding that's required. So if we move on, the other item that we looked at initially, which I wanted to touch upon, was the, the use of the mortars. And there's a couple of illustrations there, you know, preparing a plug of mortar by hand and then using it to insert to deal with a leak. And the steering, with the steering group, we actually devised a way of testing these. So what you've got here is a one meter diameter manhole inside a 1.5 meter diameter manhole, which allowed water to be put between the two. And we were then able to do a, develop a series of damage scenarios. Now these damage scenarios were designed by the sewer network owners on the steering group based upon their experience. They were used to having single holes, multiple holes. If you remember back to my first slide I showed you with the brick manhole with water spurting into it. it this is simulating a, a, a group of fairly close um, applied um, holes. Then often holes were found around or leaks around the joints and maybe the joints were further damaged. So we were able to simulate those, apply the plugging mortars and then see what happened in terms of dealing with these jets. And a number of uh, things were discovered. If you look on the left hand side, here are these four types of damage. And here these colored circles represent overall the, uh, the types of um, abnormality observed. Green means there was nothing, the plugging mortar fixed the hole, whereas red means there was infiltration and you know, red and yellow means a moisture plume. If you look at the red and yellow and the green, so the isolated damages, three quarters were fixed and a relatively small number were, were not resolved with different types of mortars. For the area damage, you can see about half, there were no no abnormalities, but we found abnormalities in some of the others. The manhole ring was a little bit more difficult, but then the, the sort of bigger leaking joint, we were having, relative, it would, they, that seemed to be particularly difficult to seal up. So there obviously are issues and care that has to be taken when using these. But the other thing was when you take all of those abnormalities, so the green is no abnormality, the yellow is any of the abnormalities that are observed, and there are different products. Each one of these columns represents a different product. And there was a ceiling effect on day one after week one, two, three, four. And obviously the details there for you if you want it, but in general, there was more abnormalities started to appear over time. So whilst you might have managed to get quite good ceiling or very good ceiling in some cases to start with, it deteriorated over time, which was a lesson learned from the exercise. And so what did we discover really? You can sufficiently seal a leak using the plugging mortars to prevent in heavy infiltration. And so you can use it to prepare to do another type of coating. But we found that they weren't really suitable for long-term sealing. And as the leakage started to increase over time. Another thing that was done was to do some tensile strengths to see what their adhesion was to the surface of the manhole. And it was found that they weren't as good. They weren't as strong as the original material, as the brick or as the concrete. So these are potentially weak spots that, that could give way when you've got a, a, a subsequent lining. And it was found especially with plastic coatings that you can get detachment uh, from these areas. So one of the things that's necessary with a a lining system or a rehab is it should be strong enough to be able to resist water pressure from small areas where let's say the plugging mortar uh, might might not uh, function continuously. So in terms of the main research that we undertook with the manhole rehab, uh, 
we set about with the 17 sewer network owners to really identify and understand the problem. And so uh, a lot of field studies were undertaken with them, going and looking at manholes and rehabilitated manholes and also considering the techniques and the methods that could be used. So these field investigations were used and then in conjunction with the sewer network owners, typical damage scenarios were developed. Now you'll recognize these really from the ones I've previously showed you from the plugging mortar. So individual points where infiltration is getting in, damage around a leaking joint, and that pattern of three, of, of nine holes together. Um, as part of the experiment, the steering group wanted to see what actually happens when you don't have proper substrate prep preparation. So on some of these patch areas, a mold release agent was applied so that actually there was not going to be proper bonding. And this was done particularly just to see what would happen to an installed lining um, in such a situation. Now, normally you would expect that that would be cleared off and it would be a proper adhesion, but this was particularly as part of the experiment to see what would happen in these areas. The market review that was undertaken with them um, identified what, what was available at the time um, in Germany. And then we were able from that to put together the available products into technology types. And essentially there's the three technologies that were identified. Mortar coatings, this is where you're applying the whole way around 360 degrees, the full depth, a, a mortar that will harden off and will provide the rehabilitated surface to the manhole. Then plastic coatings come in various forms and often are applied by spray, perhaps by manual or by a, a spinning head automatically down the shaft, or they may be finished off by, by hand. And with those, you're, and with mortars, you're applying layers and you can adjust the thickness. And then there are linings which are perhaps more, um, more physical. So um, here's an example where you have pieces of GRP being applied and adhering onto the inner surface. And again, you can build those up. And you can also have a situation where you can actually slide, if you like, a complete circular new manhole in and grout in behind it. So those are the three technologies that we were looking at. But how to compare them? So a one-to-one -one scale test rig was required. And this was devised again by the sewer network operators. So they, remember, these are the guys who've got the problem and these are the guys who want a solution. So they want to see that um, the products which are available are going to be compared sort of like for like. And so what you see here in this test pit, which is six meters deep, we're starting to build up here a series of circular manhole chambers. There were 13 products compared, and so there were 13 six meter deep manholes constructed, gradually filled with sand as they went up, and at the top, finished off with a cap to look like a normal manhole. And so this is what the, uh, so the, the contractors and suppliers who participated were presented with, essentially a real manhole, which they had to rehabilitate. There was a little bit of extra experimentation done uh, we had a couple of rectangular manholes installed. Uh, working with us were some Belgian sewer network owners. And in Belgium, they, had, they were particularly interested in rectangular uh, pattern rather than circular. And they wanted to know how an automatic spinning head would distribute the, um, the, the rehabilitation lining. Uh, we did also look at a plastic manhole because at the time plastic manholes were being offered and they just wanted to know, did they float up out of the ground when you fill it with groundwater? And this was a, an element of this. So here, if you look, there's a cross section segments here. We've got, uh, we're looking at side on at three of the manhole chambers. We had the ability to add groundwater and simulate rising and falling groundwater within those chambers. And I'd like you just to remember, I'll keep it in my in, in your mind, this, this illustration here showing that there's different segments involved in this manhole because we had to install damage scenarios. 
This is a complex and busy picture. But what I'd just like you to focus on, we have the manhole on the left-hand side here, a series of segments. There are five rings. And so the ring damage was applied. You can see a ring here at the top, uh, four individual damages either side. We then had uh, segments where we had individual holes which were drilled through. And then we had these areas of uh, nine holes together drilled through and you can see a couple of areas of uh, larger diameter of the, of the nine hole damage each either side of the ring and then various single hole damages and we did do one further thing which is up here the top segment was deliberately broken so after it had been installed and after the sand had been built up either side we put in a um, a, pr a pressure jack which applied pressure both sides from the inside and cracked it open to weaken it. So we could look later at, did the lining actually restore the strength of the manhole? We couldn't crack them from the outside or prepare it in advance because we had to simulate it the same for everybody. So the cracking was done from the inside out just to break the, uh, the circumferential strength of the manhole. Uh, right, I made a, left a mistake on there. It's not plugging mortars. This is the looking at the product. So we mentioned the five, the three technologies, mortar coatings, plastic and lining. We ended up, the steering group selected six mortars, three plastic coatings and four of the more segmental coatings using GRP or HDPE. And what happened was that the, uh, the suppliers, manufacturers are invited to come and see the test rig to see what they were being asked to repair and they were asked to provide a tender and they were actually paid for the installation because this is a project being run by sewer network owners and independent of the manufacturers they were paid to treat it as if it was a typical installation that they were doing only on this occasion it was in a laboratory so we were able to observe the installations in some detail and was able to look at in real time the manuals, the, 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 the training, the, the whole the quality assurance element of this. And also we had some indications of costs and manpower and the time taken to do these installations. And all of this is reported in the uh, project report. The evaluation, which was devised by the project steering group comprised two elements. The actual systems test, the actual performance of the product, but also quality assurance. So on quality assurance, they wanted to know, was there a proper installation manual? Uh, do they have technical data sheets? Were the contractors trained? Are there training courses available? Um, could they produce test certificates to prove the claimed performance of the product? Um, was there any particular um, QA monitoring that was put in place to routinely check what was happening when these things were installed for real. And then the, uh, the score for the uh, systems, we were looking at particularly at water tightness and ability to, for load bearing, adhesion to the sides, the robustness, things like did it scratch, was it rough? Um, the acceptance, uh, when you looked at, when you, uh, what the products really looked like when they, were, when they were installed, how good the installations were. And uh, the total score, 85% 85, 85 awarded for that and 15 for the other made 100% against which the results were compared. Now, there are a number of different evaluations that were possible. Optical, as I mentioned, cracks, holes, color differences, where the water was getting in. The acoustics, tapping to see if there were hollow areas. Um, the roughness, the sounding, the scratch resistance. The odor or smell. Actually, if you're going to install a rehab system, which is then going to smell badly afterwards and will be noticed by the public, that is an issue for sewer network owners. And then we had the sewer and adhesion tests. I'm fl flicking through this relatively quickly because I'm sure if you are interested in the detail, you can you can you can go and find out later. But um, we had a, a program of that rising and lowering water table. 
So initially starting with it at zero, over a period of time, uh, steps from, from one meter to two to three to four to five meters depth, each about three days, the groundwater pressure was increased. And an evaluation was taken when we got to the top, the five meters, looking to see if there were any conspicuous damages, bulging out of the sides, leaks, um, wet damp patches on the inside. And then they were given a long-term two months at five meters. At the end of that, any defects could be, we, we invited the refurbisher back in to, to fix any defects to see if they could. And then it was a, a, a further period of five meters was applied to see what would happen to where the defects had been dealt with. Another element of all of this, and this is particularly the case when we're doing a, perhaps uh, repairs to sewer pipes themselves, is what actually happened in terms of the um, serviceability. So the sewer network owners, they made a decision about the serviceability. We did the adhesion tests. We did CCTV inspections at various stages throughout. But some of you may say, what about, well, this is in the laboratory, how good is this? So what was also done was to go out and see the same products being installed for real in the, um, out in the field. And there's particularly just to make sure that nothing that happened in the lab was at variance from what would normally happen out in the field. So what we discovered, you, we found quite a lot of issues like this with the mortar coatings, you've got damp patches, cracking, maybe some issues of particularly because we had installed the, the, the foot rungs was to see what would happen around the foot rungs. And occasionally you've got, you got actual pinholes of leakage. And then when you look at, let's say the plastic coatings, we've got bottom right here, some bulging going on. We've got pinholes top right, maybe some issues again, around fitting around the, around the foot rests. And uh, in one case, we actually had a product which basically failed. It bulged out too far from the wall um, in order to be able, you could no longer get access down into the, into the invert in this chamber. I did mention as well that we had um, broken that top ring. We'd used the hydraulic ram to break the top ring. And what would then happen, of course, is that um, we were then able to go in and apply pressure again, and we used uh, movement sensors to see what movement would have, because essentially what you would get if we applied pressure, this is exaggerating a bit of movement and perhaps weakness, and you could see failure. And this rather complicated graph on the right, what you really need to just know about that one, we took 100% value as the ring stiffness before the break. So it's at 100%, and these are the different products along the bottom here. That's blue. Brown showed the ring stiffness, so it was down to about 50% strength. You've got to bear in mind you've got the ring, but you've got the soil as well. So we've broken it. And then we looked again after the installation of the rehab technique. And in some cases, it massively increased the strength. But in almost every case, it at least brought the ring back to the original strength it had before it was broken, which was an interesting positive result for the sewer network owners to give them some confidence about the ability of these rehab techniques to restore the, if you like, the structural integrity of manholes. It wasn't a perfect type of evaluation, but it did at least compare across technologies and got some comparable results. Overall, everything is scored. You don't need to look at the, see the detail here, and it, unfortunately it's just too difficult on a slide to generally see it. But each one of the columns is a product, and overall, they are given a score. Uh, the German system for scoring is from sort of naught or one is extremely good, 100%, down to six, which is extremely poor. It's a system used, unfortunately, if you're at school. If you get a one, you've done well at your class. If you get a six, a uh, little bit of room for improvement, I'm afraid. So, um, and the system tests were scored and also the quality assurance was scored. So we have products worth scoring very well. The best score was 6.1, uh, 1.6 overall, good, down to satisfactory here. That's the first uh, of, the, of the products. In many cases, actually, though, they might have been extremely good, but they were only, they scored poorly 
for QA, for some of the quality assurance on so this one here, a very good score, 1.5 for the performance of the product, but they only scored 5.5 because they really didn't produce enough quality assurance information to go with the product. And if we look at the rest of them, we got right down to the one which was couldn't be evaluated because it came away from the wall. They did quite well. They got a good for their QA, although the product didn't perform so well. So what we res what, what came out was a variety of results, and it enables you to see that in some cases, they might have done extremely well in some tests and poorly in others. The overall score gives a general performance for them. And therefore, what does all of this tell us in terms of dealing with the quality assurance of manholes? So perhaps the first conclusion was actually, yes, you can reliably rehabilitate a manhole against groundwater. But we've got a range of scores. So individual systems or products do perform in different ways. So range from good to sufficient. So this needs to be considered if you are trying to, if you are selecting techniques. What was very clear as well, the project, particularly with the use of those mold release agents to simulate poor preparation, confirmed what was already suspected with some of the damages that were being seen. What you have to bear in mind is, is that once a manhole has been rehabilitated, relined, you can't really see what is behind the lining system. And so uh, what we were looking at by preparing damages and artificially creating situations was trying to understand what people were seeing when they went into a rehabilitated manhole. So we did get one well, the one system that completely failed and we did have others where we got some cracking, some blistering, some hollow points. And that could lead to subsequent leaks so it would need to be dealt with post installation. And this next sort of finding is perhaps where possibly one of the major causes if you do see damp or, or failures of uh, lining systems. And that is that it's actually costs, it's, it's, it costs money, it takes time to actually prepare the substrate properly. And really when it comes to um, preparing tenders or receiving tenders, special attention must be paid to this preparation, including perhaps inspection before the, after, after it has been prepared and before the lining system goes in. It is a, it's almost an art as well as science. It requires experience, it requires money. Some of the equipment can be very expensive. You might even need to use blasting materials, you know, uh, mixed in with the, the high pressure water. So it is a very, very serious exercise that must be very, very carefully considered, costed and programmed into any exercise. You can't just turn up and rehab a sewer. You've got to, uh, 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 sorry, a manhole. You have to prepare it first of all. And again, of course, this is going back to those plugging mortars. We did discover, yes, they will work. And I'm re-emphasizing this, this point. They will work. You can stop the infiltration you can, in order to make it easier for you to do the uh, to do the preparation. And when you think about it, if you go back to that right at the beginning, the lining I, you, you saw with the ring where the lining was bulging all the way around, you really have got to stop that infiltration or time the rehab for a time of year when the water table is low. So you're not going to get that pressure whilst the lining is going in and curing. And so it, you do have to ensure that the lining system is going to be strong enough to deal with any subsequent um, failure of any mortars that are used behind. Um, what we did discover, though, is if there are problems, you're going to see them quickly. During that um, exercise with the rising groundwater, where I said we left it for an extra two months, what we tended to find was that we didn't see any new damage appearing you just saw what was there, perhaps the cracks getting a bit worse, perhaps the damp patch turning into some small drops. And of course, that therefore means that, um, of course, if you're going to do an acceptance inspection, 
There's no point in doing it when the groundwater level, level is low. Maybe wait till the winter time or the spring when the groundwater has risen again and then go and check to see whether the installation has been effective. And what we did discover as well is that we got quite differing results in terms of adhesion. And this was a, again, sometimes down to the deficiency in the, uh, in the bonding, which is another reason why it's extremely important to do the preparation first. And really, I think what the sewer network owner needs to do if they are, have chosen a technique is they have got to really understand the instruction manual, discuss with the supplier, uh, discuss with the manufacturer what has got to be done to ensure that that product is going to work perfectly because they should all work in ideal conditions. You've just got to take the time to prepare the ideal condition for it. Um, I'll just re-emphasize, we use, the MAC was the system we use with the, with the pressure, with the, with the RAM and the, uh, the hydraulic RAM and uh, the, uh, the movement sensors. But we did actually usefully discover that in the evaluation we did, you could restore the strength, the ring stiffness using all the techniques were there. And another point was, we did discover that actually the quality assurance was fairly patchy. So um, something that tends to happen after these exercises, and they've been done on a lot of different types of products, is that it's actually a great benefit for the suppliers and manufacturers and contractors, because often they go away and improve their QA, or perhaps devise a training program around their product, um, improve the installation manual to cover off the points, because what we've shown is what worries a sewer network owner. And if you then address those, you're creating USPs for your product and you're helping with, um, with convincing end users to, to make use of them. But uh, they, weren't, they couldn't always show training certificates. They couldn't necessarily show that the product has been through any kind of external evaluation or approval. So that is obviously vital to consider. And um, perhaps finally, what was really realized was that um, we found that the, the knowledgeable inspectors, because amongst our steering group, we had many people who were very well experienced. They went down and looked at the manholes and we really proved that actually a knowledgeable inspector can identify uh, the defects. And it really therefore means that um, it is worth doing a proper inspection after an installation and then ensuring that the supplier comes back and fixes because we did the exercise where they were able to demonstrate they could fix them. So pinholes, hollow cracks, etc., need to be dealt with. And they should be dealt with at an early stage, relatively soon after they have been, uh, been installed and they may, um, you know, reworking is needed. All of this was actually this put for, through, I'm just about coming up to my last slide, um, as an appendix to the report, there is a ZTV. Now ZTV is an additional technical terms document uh, in Germany. And it was, it was designed to provide guidance, wording you could use in a contract between a client and a contractor to improve the QA for remediation. So it looks like this, it's in German uh, and it's the, the Munster ZTV. And I've just translated the content of it into English. So it does actually include information that the client, the sewer network owner should give to the contractor. Things like information about groundwater levels, condition of the, of the manhole. And it also identifies what documents really the contractor should be supplying when they are making a tender. And what documents should be provided about the procedure. There are issues about site requirements and preparation and pre-sealing. So what should you be considering at those points? And then for the, there's the different lining and coating systems, just a few points about issues to consider with different technologies. And then highlighting some QA and what sort of documentation to, to, to keep afterwards. So that is really the, um, if you like, one of the very useful, um, ready to use documents. It's a 49 page appendix number four. And I would finish off final slide is really, um, where can you find this? The 
Research is in, published in German, extremely well illustrated by colleagues at IKT are great at taking photographs. So even if you can't read German, you can understand quite a lot, few of the photos. And it is relatively easy to using modern translation packages, um, or you can ask us for assistance if you wanted to know something about it. Um, this is the English translation of the pages that appears. This is the Google Translate. So it's on ikt.de under downloads, and it's called a Varent uh, under Varen tests. So there's a 72 page report just on the comparative tests, 392 pages of research report. And that contains the evaluation of the jetting, the evaluation of the plugging mortars and all the elements of the exercise. And after the event, two more companies submitted their products for separate testing. We recreated it and we actually tested two more products. And that essentially is my gallop through many years of research and uh, which probably put years on the life of my colleague Marcus Giller. Uh, thank you very much Albert, that concludes the short presentation. <laughs>